I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Exodus 20 is our text as we're continuing our guardrail series. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, I'm just going to encourage you to grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you uh, and turn to page 72. If you're at McCulloch campus, turn to this, in the seats around you, there are Bibles, turn to page 72. If you're at Parker, then there's uh, Bibles right in the back uh, in the middle uh, at the table there. Go grab you one. And as always, whatever campus you're at, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, you want to read God's Word, then we want you to take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, I just want to take a moment and give a shout out to the Parker campus. I was there last week. And so, Parker, hey, it's good to see you and you guys uh, endure well. They're all excited about you as well. So uh, it was a lot of fun. We'll be back down there again. But, uh, uh, you know, God is doing great things in Parker. He's doing great things in Havasu. And we are celebrating that. Hey, speaking of great things, I had a, the opportunity today... Uh, which is Saturday, uh, to participate in the Calvary Christian Academy golf tournament. They do that to raise funds. I keep hearing this thunder. Is that me or is that, uh, no, it's not me. Okay, it's thunder. All right, maybe it's thunder. Hey, I don't know what you guys are hearing it, but I'm going, going yes, Lord, huh? go and speak. <laughs> but I had a chance to play in the golf tournament. Some of you may not even realize that we have a Christian Academy with about 300 students. And, uh, and so this is one of their big fundraisers. They did a golf tournament and, uh, and a gala tonight. But uh, I share that with you because it's also tax season. And in Arizona, if you pay Arizona state income taxes, you have an opportunity to bless students at Christian schools. And I just want to encourage you, if you're going to have to uh, you know, give the state money because uh, you owe them taxes, you can designate part of that to Calvary Christian Academy and bless those almost 300 students uh, and help them pay their tuition so they can get a Christian education uh, through our ministry that blesses those families. So I just want to encourage you to do that. If you don't know anything about that at all and you do your own taxes, pick up one of the brochures at the Connection Centers on your way out or uh, just mention it to your accountant. If somebody does your taxes, they should understand that, know about that, and uh, you guys can learn about it together. If they don't know, have them call us. We'll be glad to help them figure that out. But it's just a, a way that God has given us an opportunity to bless students and influence families with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that's an opportunity we should not miss uh, as stewards of God's uh, resources. So uh, how many of you have ever been lied to? <laughs> oh, okay. How many of you have ever been lied about? <laughs> what do you know, huh? Uh, when, when you were lied about or lied to, did it cost you? Did, did it cost you a job or a promotion? Did it cost you your reputation or maybe a relationship? Or, or, or maybe it cost you money. It could have even cost you your freedom. See, the, uh, 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 when that happens to us, how does that make you feel? When somebody lies to you or lies about you, what does that do to you as a person? Does that make you feel good? No, okay, I heard someone's over here. It makes you angry. Does anybody here actually want to be lied to? Does anybody ever go into a relationship saying, hey, I don't want the truth? <laughs> Just lie to me all the time. See, I, I, I've been lied to a lot. Uh, now, the worst ever... Uh, was that uh, we unknowingly as a church hired a con artist couple to lead our school back in 2001. And uh, they lied about everything, except maybe their kids' names, and that, I don't even know about that. So, uh, but they stole or uh, actually embezzled about $40,000, cost us about another $40,000 uh, because they like, did you know, unethical things like not pay the taxes uh, and all. And uh, they have a felony to prove that now. <clears throat> but it was infuriating. It was frustrating. And, and ultimately, uh, it was redemptive in time. But that, that pain, that anger, that angst, that frustration, the damage that was done through the lies, uh, it, it took a whole season of life at Calvary away from us. And, and now God redeemed. And, and trust me, we still trust here at Calvary. But at Calvary, we embrace accountability. We believe in it uh, enthusiastically. We're going to trust, but we're going to validate. 
So uh, that's kind of our, our, our just way of doing it. So, uh, you know, I got to turn in receipts just like everybody else and, and do all that. So, uh, so here's a simple question. If we hate being lied to, why do we tell lies? If you haven't guessed it yet, we're discussing the ninth commandment. And that's found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, which says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness. Now, uh, do you know the commandments yet? Because this is the ninth week. We've been encouraging you to memorize the commandments. You know, there's ten of them, ten statements. Uh, so here's what, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take about 30 seconds, and to the person next to you, I want you to see how many you know, how many they know, okay? Ready, set, go. There's only 10. See how many you can get. Can you get them? How you doing? Some of you are just staring at each other. Some of you aren't even looking at them. No, no eye contact. You don't even want to do that. You know them? <laughs> know what okay so I'm assuming because you're still talking that you're getting it worked out okay you know maybe you came up with 15 I don't know about that is that a commandment I don't know you know you shall not eat the last piece of pizza is not a commandment so let's just let's just say them together you know it starts off with God reminding them that he's the Lord their God that brought them out of Egypt out of the house of slavery and he has those 10 statements you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any idols or graven images. You shall not take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not covet. Okay, that's the ten. Uh, you know, these are the guardrails that God gave us to keep us, uh, keep our lives from crashing. Keep us in the path of his blessings. So uh, the ninth commandment is about bearing false witness. And the original intent was to protect the integrity of justice. The original intent was to protect the integrity of justice. I'm going to encourage you, if you have a Bible like mine, turn one page over to Exodus 23. And listen to the first three verses. Because... Um, if you don't know this, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, are, are the law. And, and, you know, Genesis is really just kind of a history book. And, and then Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy are kind of, you know, history and law intermixed. And all the rules and laws to live by. So there's a lot of, this is what you're, how you're supposed to do this. So he says, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. See, see God is explicit in terms of establishing the nation of Israel, and he wants them to be a nation of law and justice. He, he wanted everyone to be treated fairly. And that only works if people are honest in legal proceedings. Okay? This is integrity. This is about the, the way we're going to function as the people of God. And in fact, God took it so seriously that later on in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 19, he says this. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. And the judges shall inquire diligently, listen to this, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother." So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Do you catch that? I mean, if you accuse somebody of stealing and, and they're going to, you know, have to pay you back, you know, a whole bunch of money, then guess what you have to do if it's a false witness? You've got to pay them money. And, and if you accuse them of a capital offense and they were going to execute him, guess what they're going to do to you? Execute you. I mean, that's pretty serious stuff because God takes justice seriously. 
He wants his people to live in, in, a, in a world that is about justice. Because that is God's nature. God is just. He is righteous. And he wants his people to practice justice. Because, and we all know this, we already said it, injustice angers us. Right? I mean, it just ticks you off when there is injustice and it affects you. I mean, because when we experience injustice, what do we want to do? Okay, we want to get even. We want to take it into our own hands, right? And when we take justice into our hands, we don't really want to get even. We want to one-up them, right? We want to get even plus. It's called revenge, right? And, and, and so that's why bad things happen when, we, when that, you know, we take that into our own hands because we don't usually do an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. We usually do a little bit more than that. So have you ever suffered injustice? You personally, have you ever, ever had something unjust happen to you? And you, were, and you were in that place where you're like, what is going on? It's so infuriating. So in that embezzlement case that I mentioned earlier at Calvary, after about two years had passed, and, and, and they'd already pled guilty, uh, they had the, the uh, kind of the sentencing damage hearings, you know, so how much are they going to have to pay back? And it was crazy. We, we went to the, the court, and they've already pled guilty, and then they start, you know, just pouring out all these lies about how we owe them money. I'm serious. And, and, and we're sitting there listening to it, and our lawyer didn't care because the guy was already, he'd already signed the plea deal, it didn't matter. And uh, we cared because it's like these are just lies, it's bringing up the hurt all over again. And, uh, and, and so we're just listening to this stuff, and I actually had to put my wife out of the courtroom before she got sentenced to jail for contempt of court. <laughs> I mean, she was so angry, and she was muttering, and she was saying stuff out loud, and I threw her out. I just said, I don't want to have to bail you out of jail. Uh, and, uh, and in the end, this, this guy who was guilty and who had admitted he was guilty and who had stolen $40,000 and cost us about, you know, a total of $80,000, the, the judge said he had to pay back $20,000. Oh, it uh, gets better. He, he paid back a few hundred dollars. That's it. But God, no, he didn't have to go to jail. But God is the one who really enforces justice. And God redeemed that situation. So I want you to hear this. You know, it was infuriating in that courtroom, but God has provided bountifully and miraculously because I mentioned we have a school with almost 300 students that is thriving and healthy and operating in the black. So yeah, that's kind of cool, isn't it? So uh, here's, a, here's a question for you. Do you get angrier about injustice that happens to you or to other people? Because see, sometimes we get really upset about the injustice that happens to us, but we're kind of okay with injustice that happens to others, when I think God would have us be more upset about the injustice that happens to others than to us. So injustice angers us, and injustice destabilizes society. When you get right down to it, when justice is absent, then feuds are born. And, and feuds aren't about justice. Feuds are about revenge. And, you know, you always escalate. So you kill one of ours, we'll kill two of yours. So you kill four of ours, and we'll kill eight of yours. And, and, it, and it, it turns into this escalation because that's what sin nature does. Sin, you know, it, it, it wants us to be angry. And it wants us to get, uh, you know, it wants to be vindicated. And it wants to act out in God's place of justice. And, and so we want to escalate all the time. And so... Uh, when justice is corrupted, people lose faith in the system, and therefore they want to take justice in their own hands. And, and, and the United States is a nation of law. Think about it. We were established, we say this in our pledge, with liberty and justice for all. Right? Liberty and justice for all. That's the, that's the pledge. That's the goal. So do you think the wealthy and the poor face the same treatment by our criminal justice system? Do you think the politically connected face the same consequences as the average Joe? See, and, and yet we've probably got the best situation in all the world when it comes to justice. But injustice and false accusations do real damage to society. And we've seen example after example after example of that in current events. And God blesses us, all of us, by protecting the integrity of justice. That's why he said, you shall not bear false witness. 
He wanted to bless the entire nation. He wanted to bless all of his people through the preservation of justice. So now let's talk about the guardrail of truth. The guardrail of truth. How does this command about justice relate to us as individuals? Because when we live within the guardrail of truth, we're going to be blessed and it's going to keep our lives from crashing. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, by that we mean that you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for sins, your sins, my sins, sins of the world, you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord, then God expects you to be faithful and true. God expects us as his people to be true. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus identified himself with the truth. He said, if, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. He said, if you abide in my word, then you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are people of the truth. And as people of the truth, we can't represent Jesus if we are people who lie and deceive and misrepresent truth and practice slander and gossip and false accusation. Why don't you think about that? If we're followers of Jesus and we are people of the truth, Jesus himself said he was the truth. How can we represent him if we lie? How can we represent him if we deceive? How can we represent him if we misrepresent truth? You know, well, I didn't tell a lie. I just led them to believe one. How can we represent Jesus if, if we're quick to, uh, you know, practice the art of innuendo? If we're quick to, to, you know, question somebody's character without proof. And, I, and when I say without proof, I don't mean because you think so. I mean because they've proven it. See, the Apostle Paul challenged the church with these thoughts. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, Speaking the truth in love, we, followers of Jesus, are to grow up in him who is the head into Christ. In other words, one of the marks of, uh, of a mature Christian is somebody who speaks the truth in love. Somebody who's truthful and loving. Later on in that same chapter, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We tell the truth because we're connected, we're the body, and lies hurt all of us. They, they cause all of us pain. So if we're going to represent Jesus, if we're going to live blessed lives, we need to tell the truth. And that means we need to tell the truth in relationships. In relationships. Uh, let me just be really honest. Marriages need truth to thrive. Marriages need truth to thrive. Every relationship needs truth to thrive. When I say that, I don't mean brutal honesty, but truth spoken through the filter of love. Right? Right? Because some of you, are, you take pride in your honesty, but you also like to bludgeon people with your honesty. No, honey, it's not the pants that make your butt look big. <laughs> right? I mean, you're just kind of like, yeah, there's, there's honesty. There's, yeah, that's why I, I led with the Ephesians passage, speaking the truth in love. And, and so we need to be honest in our relationships. Now, it might be tempting to lie to avoid a fight. But truth with conflict is better than a false peace. Truth with conflict is better than a false peace that's built on lies because that false peace is going to end in your marriage crashing. Be, look, trust is the foundation of every relationship and trust needs truth to breathe. Okay, if you don't have truth, you're going to lose trust. And, and, and I've seen so many couples struggle with that because they think it's just a little lie, it's just a little lie, a little lie, and one day they wake up and the other person just has no trust because they don't know where the lies start and the truth starts. Now, if you struggle at this point, 
telling the truth in relationships, I just want you to know that uh, our next life group session, sign up start in a couple of weeks, uh, that life group session starts at the end of March. Uh, we're going to be having a special marriage life group segment. So if you're in a life group, your group has the option to, uh, you know, do a uh, course of study seven weeks on marriage. Uh, and uh, and we're, then we're going to have some new life groups just for the, the marriage session. So if that's something that you struggle with, you're like, hey, our relationship needs to learn how to speak the truth in love, then you may want to check that out and sign up for that. You'll hear more about that next week. I just wanted to kind of uh, get you started thinking about that. And... and and the same is true with your children and your friends. Be honest about who you are, about what you believe, about where you're going. It's much easier to live that way than trying to remember what you told who. See, tell the truth. That way you don't have to remember what you said. Just tell the truth. By the way, have you noticed how our society assumes that lying is part of relationships? I think about all the romantic comedies that you watch at the movies or on TV. What, what's part of the tension in those relationships as that romantic comedy unfolds? It's lies. It's lies about who they are. It's lies about what they want. It's lies about their past. It's lies about their intentions. It's, it's all lies. And of course, in the movies, it always works out okay. Uh, that's not how it really works out in real life. Can I just tell you that Hollywood has it wrong? And God has it right. And if you want your relationship to thrive, then tell the truth in those relationships. And not only should you tell the truth in relationships, but be honest with yourself and about yourself. Be honest with yourself and about yourself. Uh, we are neither as good as we want to be or as bad as we think we are. And that's true for all of us. We're not as good as we want to be, and we're not as bad as we think we are. And, and this is true because we're, you know, we're living in that tension between who we wish we were and who we're afraid we'll be, or who we're afraid people will think we are. Scripture says you're pretty good because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're made in the image of God. You're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. I mean, there's all these statements in Scripture about how wonderful you are. And Scripture tells us that we're sinners. That there's not one of us who's righteous, not even one. We are rebellious, we are evil, our hearts are evil. And all of that is true, and at the same time, God loves you. God loves every one of us, and he, he purchased our redemption through the sacrifice of Jesus. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. For our rebellion, for our defiance. So, you know, you're wonderful and you're terrible and God loves you. But you're not as good as you wish you were. And you're not as good as you want people to think you are. But you're not as bad as you're afraid they'll find out. I know some of you right now are probably thinking, you know, I, uh, I'm a lot worse than you know. And I'm afraid that you wouldn't really like us if you found out who I really am. Can I just tell you that God knows who you really are? You're not, you're not fooling him. He's been there. He's been watching you. He's seen you. And he loves you. Yes, you. He's talking to you right now. If you think you're unlovely, if you think you're unworthy, if you think you're insignificant, if you think you're unimportant because of what you've done, God loves you. And you need to be honest with yourself and about yourself. And part of that honesty is that you are valued by God enough for him to sacrifice Jesus because he wants you in his family. Now that is pretty cool. And so I want to make sure you hear that. And then I want you to be honest about yourself and I want you to be honest with yourself because we really wrestle with telling the truth to ourselves. We really do. I mean, can you tell the truth to yourself? Uh... Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here and say that most of us uh, lie in print. Because most of us have a driver's license. And the two most common lies that we tell are height and weight. And we overestimate one and we underestimate the other. Right? And, and, and oh, well, you know, we're actually honest, you know, about the weight if we're talking about 20 years ago. But um, the... Uh, 
we do that. We do it on print, and we do it on purpose, right? Somebody asks you height and weight. The only time you're really honest is when you're getting on a small airplane, and they got to really figure it out, <laughs> right? Because then you're looking at it going, uh, do I want to lie or do I want to live? Uh, so can you tell the truth to yourself? Hey, one of the reasons we encourage you to read the Bible, to take the Bible and read the Bible, is because if you really honestly read the Bible, God is going to tell the truth to you about you. That's why we say, hey, if you need one, take one. Because we know if you engage the Bible and you read it and you invite, ask God to teach you, he is going to speak from the words of Scripture into your life and he's going to tell you the truth about you. And, and by the way, I hope you are reading along with us uh, the New Testament this year. That was our, our goal. We started off the year that way. And some of you are like, oh, yeah, I meant to do that. But if you start reading one chapter a day out of the New Testament and you start doing it today, you'll finish around Thanksgiving and read the entire New Testament. One chapter a day. Are you willing to invite God to speak into your life one chapter a day? Five to ten minutes of reading a day to say, God, hey, can, can you talk to me? Can I hear from you? Because I need some truth that applies to me. That's how we know we're not as good as we wish we were or as bad as we think we are. When we open up our hearts and, and let God show us who we are and affirm us as his children. So can you tell the truth to yourself? And can you, can you tell the truth about yourself? See, this is scary to some of you, too, because you're thinking, if they only knew, they wouldn't like me. And the truth is, we do know, and we do like you. You go, oh, yeah, you don't know what I've done. Not specifically, but trust me. This is a place where we practice confession. We admit our weaknesses and our failures, and, and, and we celebrate God's redemptive power, how he has changed our lives, how he has redeemed our brokenness. And, he, and when you start confessing, when you start admitting who you really are, and how you've really failed, it, it just kills that whole shame and guilt thing that Satan wants to put on your life. Because Satan wants you to be embarrassed about your past. He wants to hold it up in the mirror, and when you look in the mirror and say, see, you are a failure, you are no good, you're a terrible person, you can't let anyone find out about that. And you know what God really wants you to do? He wants you to do what James says. He, James said, and by the way, James is the apostle, and James is the brother of Jesus, and he said this in the fifth chapter of his letter. He said, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Made whole, healthy, be alive fully. And, and, and that comes when we just go ahead and admit who we are. Unashamed because God loves us. He's already told us he's loved us. He showed us that he loved us, and, and we're not embarrassed by that. Look, every one of us in this room has failed in ways that we don't want anybody else to know. Every one of us. And yet God has forgiven us and given us life and said, you're mine and I love you. How in the world does not, that not give us the courage to go ahead and admit our failures and our weaknesses and be set free? See, here at Calvary, we're not afraid of the truth. Are you? And finally, if we're going to live in this guardrail of truth, we got to live honestly for Jesus. We need to live honestly for Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, we've already kind of talked about what that is, then understand that you represent Jesus to a world that doesn't know him. Okay? Let me say that again. The Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, for we are ambassadors for Christ. You guys know what an ambassador is, right? Somebody who represents the interests of one nation to another, who, who doesn't represent themselves, but represents the one who sent them. And so Jesus has sent you as his ambassador into the world, into the place you live, into your family, into your place of work, into your circle of friends, into the places that you go. You are an ambassador for Jesus. And, and so therefore, we need to live honestly for Jesus. That's why character is so important to us, because we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. So our words and our actions need to match our confession. If they don't, then we become false witnesses. Jesus said, some of the last words before he uh, left the earth, he, he looked at his disciples, his followers, and he said, you 
will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You're going to be my witnesses. So honestly, live for Jesus. I mean, it's, it's powerful and it's life-changing when you honestly live for Jesus. And, and when we talk about honestly live for Jesus, don't try to look like you got it all together and your life is perfect. Nobody expects your life to be perfect. And if you try to represent it as perfect, everybody knows you're lying. Right? Except the other people who are playing the game and they know you're lying because they're lying. Because our lives are not perfect. Our lives are a mess. They're just managed masses that God is redeeming day in and day out. So don't try to look like you're... In, and people are not looking for perfection. They're looking for authentic faith. And please don't embarrass Jesus by your life. Do you remember when you're, you were a teenager and your parents kind of looked at you and said, don't embarrass us? Right? Anybody else have that speech as a teenager? Okay. I had that speech. Don't embarrass us. And I knew what they meant. You know, don't make them look bad. Jesus wants us to represent him. He doesn't want us to embarrass him. Which means stuff like, don't preach to the police officer who's arresting you for DUI or domestic violence. Okay? That's kind of embarrassing right then. Don't flip people off when you're driving. Or anytime, really. But especially don't do it when you got a Calvary bumper sticker on your car. <laughs> and don't yell at the waitress or the clerk ever, but especially when you're wearing a Calvary shirt. Because if I see that, I will confiscate it on the spot. And don't pass the test by cheating. Don't lie on your tax return. Don't gossip about your neighbor. Pray for them instead. Because we're witnesses for Jesus all the time, everywhere we go. We bear his name, we, we bear his identity. And we're his witnesses. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a true witness for Jesus. And I don't want to bear false witness about him. One of our guardrails is you shall not bear false witness. I pray that you will honestly live for Jesus every single day. Because that's where the power lies in our faith. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being the way and the truth and the life. We need all of those. We need you to direct our steps we need you to pour your truth into our lives. Thank you that it convicts us. Thank you that it confronts us. Thank you that it challenges how we live day in and day out. And God, we want to be those people of truth so that we can point people to life in Jesus, so that we can direct people to life change. We want to be witnesses that are true and not witnesses that are false. So change us. Teach us and help us to live as honest sons and daughters of the living God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.